Hello there, how's it going? Today we'll be talking about Western blotting, a really, really important technique to put into your biochemistry tool set. I'd like you to do two things. One is, of course, listen to this tutorial, understand how we go through it step by step through our protocols as well as the theory and the practice. And then second thing, look at scigen.com, type in Western blotting and whatever protein that you're actually interested in doing a Western blot for, and you'll find a ton of methods that are all free and available for you to use. All right, let's get into it. I want to start out by explaining what is SDS page. SDS page is a technique for visualizing your proteins after you've separated them on a gel and transferred them to blotting paper. We'll talk about all of these individual steps, but in general, just understand that it's a method for visualizing your proteins. So your first step is to do SDS page. If you don't know what SDS page is, then Take a look at our old tutorial. We've already got the video in our show notes. SDS page is a method for separating out your protein on a gel. And here you can see we've got our samples, which are in these wells. And what happens is when you add your protein to the top, there's an electric field between the two electrodes, between the anode here and the cathode on top. When you have the electric field, and your samples are inside, as long as they've got a negative charge, they'll actually tend to go towards the anode. And that's exactly what you do in SDS page. Now, once you've separated out the samples on the gel, your next step is to transfer it to blotting paper. So here you can see we've got what we call a blot sandwich and the gel is what I just marked. The gel is right next to blotting paper or membrane. And again, there's an electric field. Look, there's a cathode and there's an anode. So you expect that proteins will actually transfer going from the gel to the membrane. Now everything is on the membrane. And that's what this blue thing is. So once it's on the membrane, we can add an antibody towards the protein of interest. We call this first antibody your primary or one prime antibody. To this primary antibody, we then add a secondary antibody. This is also called a two prime antibody. Now we've got antibodies that have bound our protein of interest on the blot. And there are these special kind of antibodies that have some kind of a signal protein where you can add a substrate and that protein will do something. The most common thing they do is to use horseradish peroxidase, which is the protein that's like a signal protein attached to the secondary antibody and a substrate which is something like enhanced chemiluminescence substrate to be able to visualize where those antibodies bound on the blot and your final data looks like this so here we've got a western blot which has a whole bunch of protein bands as you can see here and these bands are visualized using horseradish peroxidase and enhance chemiluminescent substrate. Now we're going to go through all of this step by step so that it makes more sense. But I hope that you understood the overview. In general, Western blotting is a method of visualizing your protein after you've run it on a gel using STS page, transferred it to a blot by using the transfer sandwich, which I showed you before, and then put antibodies so that you can actually target your protein of interest and then you've visualized those antibodies using horseradish peroxidase and chemiluminescence substrate. All right, now let's get into the details. So today we'll be going through a step-by-step -step protocol that's from biradantibodies.com. Biorad is really well known in the Western blotting space and their protocol is very straightforward. Their first step within the protocol is to do SDS page. I don't want to go through the details here because I've already got a separate video on what SDS page is, how to do it step by step. So take a look at the show notes. In general, what we're going to do with SDS page is to add our samples on top into a gel, use an electric field that goes between our cathode and our anode, and label all of our proteins or all our samples as negative so that they go towards this positive anode. That's it, that, that's a SDS page in a bite-sized snippet. All right, after we do the SDS page, we've got 
our gel, which has our protein inside it. Our next step is to do a transfer. And like I talked about before, we assemble a transfer sandwich in order to do the transfer. What does a transfer sandwich have? Transfer sandwich has our gel, which currently has our proteins. Our proteins are negatively charged. It has filter paper that really makes sure that the sandwich is nice and compressed in between these two blocks, which are our cathode and our anode. Plus, it has the most important thing, which is our membrane. The membrane is where the protein is gonna go. So all we have to do is assemble this entire stack or sandwich, and then we connect everything up. We have an electric field and our protein should go from our gel to our blot. And that is visualized at the bottom as well. The membrane, the blot, they all mean the same thing. This is in general how you transfer proteins. If you're like me, you find that the transfer process, taking proteins between a gel and a blot, is kind of magical. And really it kind of is. So you need to make sure that the next step you do is to check that your protein actually transferred. You do this by taking the blot and staining it with something like a Ponzo stain. Here I've got a protocol for the Ponzo stain. Really all it involves is taking your blotting paper, rinsing it with water just a little bit, placing it inside the Ponzo stain, doing a short de-stain, and then taking a picture. Your picture should look something like this at the bottom. What this shows you is, hey, your protein, which was originally in the gel, now has transferred to the blot. And you're pretty sure that because all the proteins are there, your target protein of interest should also be there on that blot. What you might also notice is that things like your molecular weight markers also transfer along with your proteins. After all of this, now you can remove the Ponzo stain. And you do that by just incubating it with a little bit of acetyl nitrile, and you wash it a little bit more, and you're done. Your blot should now look just like you had before the Ponzo stain and it's now ready for the antibody section of Western blotting. All right guys, it's time for my shameless plug. So far, we've done our SDS page and we've transferred all of our proteins and we're just about to enter the antibody section of Western blotting. I really like making these videos for you and I'd like to know that you guys like them as well. So please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Put any questions or comments you have. This will all help me grow this channel to becoming something much more than what it is now. Thank you very much. Let's get going again. All right, so far we have done our SDS page, we've transferred our protein, and we've made sure that the transferred protein actually exists using a Ponzo stain. Our next step, according to the Bayerad antibodies protocol, is to block the blotting paper. What does blocking actually mean? Well, take a look at this image below. What we've got here is we've got a blot, which is in blue. And on this blot, we've got a whole bunch of these protein bands, as you can see here. This blotting paper is actually really sticky. This is how you actually get the protein from the gel to go down to the blotting paper. That means that it might actually stick to any other protein that you put on it. And we need to stop that because we're gonna be putting antibodies, which are proteins after all. So blocking buffer is something like non-fat dry milk, casein buffer, or anything else that is considered blocking buffer. Make sure you look at your manufacturers. Companies like Byrad, Thermo Fisher, they all have their own versions of blocking buffer that you can use. You can actually add something like that onto your membrane and this mixture of proteins will block out the entire blot that doesn't already contain your bands and your proteins of interest. That's the whole idea behind adding blocking buffer. Just prevent any non-specific binding of the antibodies which are coming in the next step. All right, now that we've blocked our membrane, our next step is to just briefly wash it with some wash buffer. Wash buffer is some kind of a very light detergent. And after we wash it, we add our primary antibody, which is diluted in that wash buffer. The primary antibody is denoted here in green. Remember, we can also call these the one prime antibodies. What happens here is that the primary antibody is gonna be binding your protein of interest inside the blot. 
and later on we'll then detect all the one prime antibodies with two prime antibodies like we talked about in the overview. What's really important to know is how antibodies work. So antibodies have this kind of a Y shape. Generally there's this heavy chain and there's a light chain within the antibody and this entire antibody is produced in some kind of an animal. In this case, I'm gonna say that my antibody is produced in a goat. Now this goat antibody is gonna be binding a protein and the protein needs to be from something that's not a goat. So let's just say our goat antibody is going to target mouse proteins and those mouse proteins are what we've got on our blood. So just make sure that you choose the primary antibody based on the kinds of proteins that you have in your blood and you match your species accordingly. If you have human proteins inside your blood, then maybe you should have something like a goat anti-human primary antibody. The next step after adding the primary antibody is to wash the blood extensively. We have to wash it extensively because we don't want any of the primary antibody that's not bound to our protein of interest to be on the blood. You can imagine that if there's some primary antibody here or here, it's going to give us a false positive signal later on when we actually detect it with our secondary antibody. And that's actually what we're going to do next. So we're going to add our appropriate enzyme conjugated secondary antibody. So we should break this down. What does it mean to have an appropriate antibody? What does it mean to have an enzyme conjugated secondary antibody? First of all, the secondary antibody here is denoted in red. And remember that the primary antibody is denoted in green. Our primary that we previously talked about was a goat anti-mouse or GAM antibody. Our secondary is an antibody that needs to bind the goat portion of the primary. Not the mouse portion, because the mouse portion is what our proteins are. So we can think of it this way in our stack. Our proteins, our mouse, our primary is goat, and we need something maybe like a rabbit secondary antibody that can bind our goat antibody. So maybe this is a rabbit anti-goat, as we've kind of talked about here. Okay, so now we know what our appropriate secondary antibody is. We should now talk about what an enzyme conjugated secondary antibody means. Remember in the overview, we talked about something called HRP. HRP is an enzyme that will take a substrate and convert it into some kind of a signal. The substrate is very specific to HRP. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of signals it can make, but in general, that's what they mean by an enzyme conjugated secondary antibody. It needs to have some kind of a signal protein like HRP, which can give you a way of visualizing your protein inside your blood. And what HRP does is it'll take some kind of a substrate that has no color and the HRP will convert it into something that has a ton of color. That's what I'm trying to draw here. Sorry for the bad drawing. That's what it means to add an enzyme conjugated secondary antibody that is appropriate. The seventh and final step within our Western blotting protocol is to first wash the membrane with gentle agitation. We need to make sure again we wash it really really well so that we get rid of any of the secondary antibody that bound to the membrane by accident. After we wash it, now we're going to add an appropriate enzyme substrate. Remember previously I talked about HRP converting our substrate into a product and here at the bottom I'm showing you what that means. Different proteins like HRP can convert different substrates into different kinds of products. You can have something that takes a substrate and converts it into a product that is actually colorimetric. Colorimetric detection usually is visually very pleasing. You can see it with your naked eye, but it's not very sensitive. Another different protein might be able to convert a substrate 
into a chemiluminescent product along with light. And in this case, you might not be able to see it with your naked eye, but chemiluminescence is a very, very sensitive technique for detecting that secondary antibody. A third method might be to use fluorescence. Here, you don't actually need a substrate or product. The fluorescence is actually bound to your secondary antibody by default. That sounds pretty great, right? Yeah, it is. And that's why it's also one of the more recent methods of detecting your secondary antibody. It's not messy. It doesn't need any chemiluminescent substrate or colorimetric substrate, you just need to add your secondaries, wash them, and immediately visualize. And at the end, what you get is this. This is your Western blot data. It shows you that your protein of interest, in this case, these are tubulin proteins that we are visualizing, actually showed up at this molecular weight because you already ran a molecular weight marker, remember? And now you know, is this the right protein? Maybe not, maybe it is. You can use this as a method for detecting your unknowns, detecting known proteins. Tubulin and GAP-DH are actually pretty well-known proteins that are usually used for normalizing the data on your blood. That's a story for a completely different day. I can talk about data normalization for a long time. So hopefully, now you know how to do Western blood and you've got the data that you wanted visualized here using whatever method you decided. It could be colorimetric, chemiluminescent or fluorescent. That's it for the video. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you've learned Western blotting and that you like and subscribe to this channel so that you can keep learning more and more methods over time. Also, make sure you check out SciGen.com, which will give you protocols for Western blotting for your specific proteins. We've got over a million different methods, Western blotting, immunoprecipitation, etc. Just check it out. You won't regret it. This is Carter signing off.